Welcome back to the Academy quarterfinals where Evil Genius Academy took game one in their bout opposite Team Liquid Academy. Although it was not as clean as it looked to be crumbs after those first, say, 20, 25 minutes of gameplay. It was clean up until it wasn't. And that moment was the <laughs> barren play where Team Liquid was able to just get a steal, wipe a bunch of people, and then transition into a Kassadin that hit level 16. And they got really close, and we thought that Team Liquid was going to make a comeback. They hit all of the spikes they needed to. They were about to get Elder. And then EG took it right back. Yeah. <laughs> so, Crumbs, after that kind of game, EG clearly showed that, like, okay, we, we know how to navigate the early game. We can, we can dominate a game if we need to. Do you feel like EG, like, tighten things up now and they're just going to oh, yeah. kind of take over the series? Or if TLA are like, okay, we can hang, like, we just maybe need to adjust a couple of things in the other game and, like, we can actually make this pretty close. If I'm on EG right now, I'm going to the bathroom, splashing my face with cold water, like, come on, we know we're better than this. And you showed it, right? You, you almost had a very clean game, so... It's good that they didn't lose it, and it reminds them that whatever they had been working on is, is really showing today. So they shouldn't really panic. Whereas Team Liquid should think, okay, the early game had a lot of mistakes. The ganks that we forced were definitely not there. Yeah. We feel like we could definitely fight in the late game, but maybe we can either draft stronger early or just play more cautious and more mindful of what the enemy is trying to do. I think those two things should go a long ways for TL. Yeah, I think uh, we did highlight the jungle matchup coming into the series, and I think we saw one of the ways it can go between And and Shurnfire. So on the Team Liquid side, definitely need to see things uh, being cleaned up there because Shurn... I mean, had a great first look into that bottom lane where he got a couple summoners, and then I feel like everything else went wrong from that point onwards. Like, nothing broke his way. And a lot of that, I think, can be attributed to just playing a little bit too aggressive in spots where he doesn't have the ability to do so. Yeah, once he died in the top scuttle fight and gave over the kill to Akali, it meant that the mid lane was over, the jungle matchup was over, and then his efforts in the bottom lane got re-answered by the double TP bot lane. So it was a big disaster off of that first look. And I also think it's just not the pick that he probably is going to run with in this tournament. The Talia did not look as clean as most of the premier Talia's look, and she's just really tough to play. So you don't have to have her. You have a lot more value flexing her as well. And if your team isn't playing her mid and bottom as well, if you're the only player that's doing that, you're just asking to run into a troublesome matchup like we just saw. Yeah, I wonder if, you know... I mean, so let's talk about mid lane for a second, kind of linked to jungle. How much of Giyu's advantage that he was able to get do you think was just that, that TP that got him two kills? So he's going to be able to have an advantage against Kassadin no matter what, just because he has okay. to sustain against him. So he's going to have some sort of pressure. I think the TP play made sure that he was just not even a threat to be ganked with anymore because they tried to gank mm -hmm. him one time before that happened. And after that, they just ignored the Akali lane altogether. I think it was only that look in the top lane where he cleared the wave and then backed off. And no other time did Team Liquid think about going to that lane. Yeah, because I think that's the other place you can look to as well, right? Maybe just take something, like if you're kind of picking for Yasui, maybe just take something that can get a little bit more priority. Because even though, you know, nothing really happened in the 1v1 that looked bad for Yasui, you could definitely see that the total pressure from mid lane, shoving, being able to roam and assist your jungler, was more in favor of... EG there, and if again, Shern likes to play that way anyway as a jungler, but just got dictated to all game long by Anders. So I think there is also wiggle room to not just adjust what Shern is doing and what he's playing, but also, you know, help if you're going to play around your mid and jungle as a team, and that does seem to be one of the central identities of Team Liquid Academy, you can change the other side of that of that coin as well, which is the mid laner, and just give you Sui something where he can perform on a little bit better earlier, so that then he can pay it forward and make sure Shernfire stays ahead as well. Totally agree. Kassadin might feel like a champion that gives you a lot of agency, but because you sack the early game so much, you're just falling into the enemy's game plan if they have drafted for the early game. I think Yasui would probably look the best on a pick like the Zoe that has just been so amazing for this Academy season and the Silas. Silas is getting a lot of traction right now, and I think that that's the kind of pick that not only lets him have lane pressure, gank pressure, but really come out of a surprising laning face with his ultimate steals in a team fight. 
Yeah, we'll see though. I feel like he's not getting Zoe. If uh, the first draft we saw is any indication, but we'll see what happens here in a second. It will be the Olaf ban by Team Liquid. So a very popular pick for Shurnfire. I clearly did not like what happened with Ander on the other side. So we'll take that one away. Sejuani also going to join the pile there. Another pick that both the junglers have shared. Uh, quite a few picks on so far this split. And there's a Felios who I think will just get banned almost every opportunity and set probably in a similar boat at this point. You just don't want to be letting that stuff through. Pretty interesting that two bans right away against the jungle, yet those are champions that Shurnfire is all about. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of first pick does this mean? Because the only champion that I can think of that would really not want to play against these two would be something like an Elise. So Elise really just doesn't want to go against Olaf, who can obviously just run her down, and Sejuani who out tanks her. I don't think it's a good first pick here, but other than that, I, I would not have guessed Anda to be the one to pick on. He's been pretty solid. Yeah, I mean, maybe Shane just really wants to play Talia again and is trying to get a better matchup, who knows? Uh, closer to the last man for Team Liquid I also like. I think that champion is just uh, in a very strong state. And definitely Matt clearly showed they have that lane practice. A center actually the last band there for Evil Geniuses does leave both Orn and Yumi open. So we'll see if either team wants to go to those champions. Team Liquid pretty predictably will take Orn as their first pick though. Mm, Orn taken. There is still the Aatrox to go against him in the top lane if Brandini wants to go for that again. And they don't have that strong early game draft before. I like that Team Liquid has banned two picks from the previous drafts forcing EG to move on to something new, and it could just be Varus TK as a really safe response. You have a strong bot lane that will get you CC, and that CC from the bot lane gives you flexibility having red side to counter pick something that might be good in lane, but not so much bringing the crowd control that you need for a fight. There is the TK already selected, but we'll see what the second pick for EG here is. Taking their time with the draft, it will be Aurelia. This is something we have seen both Yasui and Giyu play to pretty great effect, but could potentially be flexed to the other solo lane as well. So very interesting to see Aurelia being taken this early in the draft. But again, uh, these two mid laners specifically do have this pick as a contested pick. It's, Aurelia is not that common for a lot of players in Academy. I think the value of Ire or the fact that Aurelia got taken this early shines a light into the Sejuani ban because Sejuani on uh, itself right now doesn't make that much sense. But if you want to take away an Orn and give that up for an Aurelia Sejuani, now that's starting to feel like a, a much worse trade. And instead, they'll play it safe by picking a tanky bottom lane and having as much CC as possible to lock down this mobile assassin in the mid lane. Yep, there is Braum and Varus, as you mentioned, but maybe CC in the bot lane will continue. Yeah, it is Ash there for Deathly. So Ash Tom Kench, kind of another... It's weird to call it a classic lane, even though Ash has been around forever. Tom Kench has, is, has now been around for a while, but not that long, certainly not since the inception of the game. But it's kind of a similar sort of thing, right? Like uh, bringing CC to your bot lane, being able to protect your non-mobile long-range carry. Uh, I'm really curious to see what happens in the ban phase here. So the first one for EG is Gragas. I'm actually looking to see if Silas gets banned here by EG or not, because that is one of the counter picks that Yasui uh, does play into Aurelio. It makes a lot of sense here to run the Silas to a lot of tanky people in the front line, lots of CC and auto attacks to chain into the Braum. Ban from Team Liquids. Mm, you probably want to target the top lane more than the jungle since those two jungle bands already went and this way and it was more about making sure that you disrupted their combos any more than those two bands feels like you're not shooting at a target and you're just taking a blind shot and hoping that it hits Anda. Yeah, you're also probably expecting jungle to be taken out of this phase anyway, so the likelihood of Shunfei getting counter pick in jungle if that's what he wants is I think higher than normal. Cassio also going to get banned away here. Uh, I imagine. Interesting to see that showed up into the Aurelia matchup, but I can see why it might be frustrating for Aurelia. Miasma, right? Drop that W yep. and suddenly you got no Qs, which is just feels good to do that to someone. <laughs> it's satisfying. It's the mental edge here. It seemed like good five seconds but for this final pick to tick down. It's been a really interesting draft. Okay, but game one also had a really cool draft, so I like that these two teams are willing to show the depth of you know their strategies in their champion pool there is the elise ban though so again more picks that shown could play but 
clearly respecting Anders' ability as a jungler. It's interesting no. that... Uh, sorry, what were you saying about Anders' no, no. jungler? I just like he's clearly a good player. I think Shenfire is willing to accept that he's playing well right now. Is not going to give him uh, these strong jungle picks. So they are going to target him a little here. And they're, and they're not giving EG three out of the five picks they played last game, which feels like a lot to target from a former draft. Usually in a game one, you'll ban maybe two, but committing this far shows us that whatever EG drafted in that first game about early game team fights is exactly what Team Liquid does not want to be playing against. And there's also the possibility that Braum is a, oh, sorry, not Braum, Orn is a flex. We have seen Yasui actually already play it this season. Um, so Gangplank will be locked in. So I'm assuming that is Gangplank top for Jenkins. Yasui going to be taking on into the mid lane. But of course, there is flexibility there as well. And that was Trundle for EG. It's their presumed jungle pick. So we'll see what Shenfire wants to do for his own jungle matchup here. There's a lot of champions taken out of the pool as, as a result of how they've drafted. So not too sure where Shen is going to fall to here. Magic damage definitely would be a good pickup here. Yes! Karthus! Oh man, Karthus versus Trundle. That feels bad for the Trundle. So I really like the Team Liquid draft here. So much different than the first game, yet they still have the elements of scaling that they wanted to hit. It's just that the execution on once you hit that level is way easier. Yep, still farm heavy as well for sure, and of course even more so now actually on the Karthus versus the Talia. This is a cool counter pick though. I feel like we don't see this champion enough, um, but I think if tanks are going to be in vogue, or if these farming matchups are going to happen, I think Cho gets super good champion. Brandini going to take it as the top lane matchup. Ooh. Hey, Brandini, Cho against Gangplank? That feels like Gangplank could abuse that really quickly. So the build from Brandini has to be very thoughtful about that. Because I'm talking things like... Gangplank sees you level one, hits you with the sword, you, lane is over, right? You've just lost <laughs> right now. Like, you don't come back from that. So I think it's a risky pick from the Cho. Um, I just want to see what Anda does around it, though, because the gank setup is huge, and you know that Shurnfire is not there to back up his lanes. He's there to farm. Yep. I mean, have to assume that uh, they knew the Gangplank was going to go top, or at least it was a possibility. So very curious to see how the matchups play out. Another really cool draft between these two teams. But with another draft in the books, we'll be stepping away for another five-minute commercial break. As a reminder, we are building up a delay to preserve competitive integrity due to the online nature of the broadcast. But we'll catch you right here for Game Start when we return.
Welcome back everyone, it's time for game two here for our second quarter final of Academy Playoffs. I'm Pastry Time, joining me is Crumbs and 1-0 up for Evil Geniuses Academy. We'll see how it looks in game two though. Again, another really cool draft, Crumbs. Yeah, we've got some picks that we never got to see during the regular season. We have the Cho in the top lane taking on the Gangplank and then we have the Irelia in the mid lane. Now Irelia we've seen a ton of, but... It feels like Giyu really likes Aurelia, so it might be a time to see some fancy outplays and not just the champion that we've been blessed with a rework for the past two years. Yeah, we've also got uh, the Shurnfire Karthus making his return. Uh, it's a champion he certainly loves as well. So a lot to look for again. Certainly looking at the junglers here for the early game to see if Shurnfire can have a better start than the one he ended up in uh, against Ander. But in general, it's a lot of cool matchups to kind of look through here. So we'll see if Evil Geniuses uh, look even better and don't maybe make the mistakes that they made uh, in the latter stages of the game. Or if TL, you know, say just one game, we can hang in a longer series here. We do believe in how we play and the picks we have. I mean, Ornn even being in this game is, is very different already. So uh, Tim Liquid Academy, not out of this series, certainly. No, not even. And the mistakes they made that last game were much on Shurnfire forcing ganks and making plays that were a little bit mistimed. Now you're playing Karthus. You don't have to make any of those plays. Your goal yep. <laughs> is simple. You farm. So they've already shored up the the issues from the game one. So I'm uh, looking at Team Liquid uh, revamped here. It's very smart drafting. You know, just uh, just give a just provide a lower agency champion. <laughs> You know? Oh, no, seriously. So sometimes yeah, if you have... A, let's say you have a player that's just playing something like, I don't know, Thresh and keeps hooking and just getting himself killed. Put him on Alistar. Now he has an ultimate and he probably stays alive a lot more and can get things done for you. Yeah, certainly. Uh, this is the style that TL knows. So Shun's going to be flying through the jungle here, starting on the blue side. Same story there for Ander, but uh, no additional leash. None really needed for the Trundle, who stays pretty healthy. Uh, just naturally, Shurnfire does have to do a lot more work to both clear quickly and safely as far as health goes. But uh, he knows his way around the champion, so we'll have a look now down to the bottom lane. Uh, definitely Matt did a really nice job with the Callista Tarakly in the head before, but significantly less aggression available to them here with the TK and the Ash. So we see both ADs have brought lethal tempo to this bot lane as well. Uh, Ash is a pretty good lane bully sometimes when she can hit that volley on two targets. Something that... Not many laners can actually do. Varus, best case scenario, he hits his E on the lane and it catches two members. But other than that, Deathly's range and range harass should allow them to control this lane. On top of the fact that Tom Kench is a really good match into Braum. That's true. And uh, definitely with a great hook shot there, it does spot where Shurnfire is. Uh, we can see he's full clearing his jungle, but it's probably not much of a surprise to EG. Regardless, but it is still good to get the information. And this matchup is certainly the one we'll be playing pretty close attention to. Brangini early on, with the help of those spikes, has been pushing the lane out, but he saw as soon as that barrel landed on Brandini, things can get rough potentially for a big melee champion like Cho'Gath there in the 1v1. And Shurn, he's gonna visit here in the bot lane, but not gonna commit too much here. Probably just a wall. As top lane, maybe more of a commitment here. And uh, gonna zoom in with the frozen domain and look for that pillar. The rupture does what? miss. And first blood for Jenkins, flash in for Ander. Is gonna look to get the kill, and I think he missed the second auto. Or the health just came back for Jenkins because he's not gonna be able to grab it. But here comes Giyu trying to redive, but he can't get it done. And Jenkins just steals first blood there. Oh, what an outplay. This is the tough, the difficulty of this matchup. So, yes, Cho has a lot of sustain, but. Because he's melee, there comes a point where Gangplank has enough her long range harass to keep Cho away from the wave. And if he can't hit the wave properly, he's low HP, he's not regenerating, and the best thing he can do is usually just last hit with his Q from a really long range, which doesn't do you justice for setting up your jungler to gank. And now Anda isn't even there to answer the fact that Gangplank is crashing this wave, so he gets a crash away for free and not miss out on anything from that gank. Yeah, not the early room for Giyu, but watch this one again. I mean, Brandini just so aggressive here. Well, I would have liked to see how he got on that other side. He was <laughs> against the minion wave, but we got a fight top. 
Yeah, Giyu also TPing in. The TP gonna be answered in though for the Orn. Here's Schoenfei, but a great pillar there from Ander. That's gonna lock uh, Jenkins in, and that will be the kill over as the Rupture lands onto Schoenfei as well. So, a force by EG, but one that does work. Really good that the, they came back to the top lane to punish the wave. They might Ooh. get more. Rupture here again, clips Schoenfei. He does have his flash. He's gonna have to use it, but the follow is there. Stun lands in as well onto Yasui. So don't think the Orn's going to be able to chase down for this one. So another kill there for Evil Genius Academy. Schoenfire once again overstepping his boundaries. It's because this wave is a big threat for Team Liquid. They need to crash this as long as there's a control ward at that try and the wave is here. They can continue to punish whoever's in the top lane. Not like Karthus or Gangplank are very good at getting away from an opponent. So now it finally crashed, but EG claimed what they were looking for. And uh, see how this initial play started. I mean, Ander really sealed the deal on this one. Three people. It, it was necessary to have all these members down here. And the silence is, I think, what stopped Team Liquid from even considering the possibility of going for more kills there. And then this is just too greedy. He wants to continue yeah. to crash the wave for Gangplank because he doesn't have TP or else he's going to be frozen up there. But then burning the flash as well hurts even more. Yeah, I mean, I think if, you, if you're going to do that, you have to communicate to your teammates as well. Like, Yasui was already walking back down towards mid lane, uh, which, if that was the play, is not where he needed to be. So, uh, whether a lapse in communication or in judgment or both for Team Liquid Academy, uh, Shonfai is looking silly again after that play, despite the good look in top lane earlier from Jenkins. But we'll see how it shakes out. It's still early day. Shonfai is still continuing his quest for blood here in the bottom half of the map. Ricardo, they're going to get the stun down. GP ulti going to finish it off and definitely dead, left on his own. The Drake, though, does go over to EG, but it does cost them their bot laner. Might cost them now, the jungler, too. Giyu, or oh, beautiful play onto Shurnfire. Had the CC duration mapped out wonderfully after the Vanguard's Edge. So Shurn dying to Giyu, who's again, same scoreline, 2 0 1 with an early vamp set to Crumbs. This guy seems like he can do no wrong right now. No, and Karthus is not even level 6, so even if he did something wrong, it's not like there would be a rave from above to punish him. Karthus needed to be farming, he was just lingering around in the bottom lane. Yasui so just gonna look for a roam as he returns to the mid lane, the original lane that he was assigned, but Karthus needs to. Start farming. This is not how you play Karthus, ganking this much. He needs to out-level and outpace Trundle in CS. Yep, like the play from Yasui. Uh, just a good dodge there from Deathly and Matt with the Devour at the ready. So uh, Yasui, who was looking for a, a roam with his ultimate, is not able to find it. Uh, Giyu, no TP, but low on mana, so he's going to have to go back to base. Build Water Cutlass, Double Dagger, is of course going to be that Blade of the Ruin King there for Aurelia, which is that buffing of that item change and the buffing of halo blades i feel like change the texture of the game so much on this patch but uh, aurelia is certainly one of the big beneficiaries of like oh if blade's good i want to play this champion again even without trinity force yeah the the blade and the fact that there's so many healthy tanks right now whether it's the orn whether it's the set or even someone like a maokai that's slowly yep. coming back into the meta means that Togath, right? <laughs> yeah you need percent hp to burn through these targets well, Rift Tower are going to be started here by TL. This is a good move here, but we'll see if Ander can spot it out. Definitely also ready with his ultimate, so now they're going to get caught in the act. But, ah, it's TL that's already roamed two up, and they can't see Kao or Yasui. Rikara also around the side, so actually a full team uh, festival here in the river. But Frangini with no TP means they cannot contest for this objective. So TL this time with the good team play to get the objective. Too suspicious that there is no one in the bottom lane answering the Cho that's crashing the wave, so... They don't want to risk it, and it's a good move not to, because those control wards were hiding all the danger that Team Liquid was loading for their trap there. I don't think Deathly saw the two people in the brush either with the hook shot, because he actually threw a hook shot uh, trying to scout out what was happening, and I don't believe he saw the two extra players in the brushes, and EG still didn't go, despite not having the information. So. Again, nice restraint here for EG. They uh, don't overstep the boundaries. They just give up the Rift Child, saying that that's an exchange that they have to make, whether they like it or not. And uh, Giyu getting a plate for himself in mid, continuing to flourish in these mid lane matchups. Not going for that fight at Herald just reminds me of playing against Karthus. He might be owed to... Wait a minute. 
Ooh, nice CC chain. GP ult down. Matt has the devour though. And uh, there's the ulti from Braum to continue the play. Definitely no flash. There's the death ray from Karthus. That's going to be a kill maybe with the Requiem. No, Matt is able to flash out to safety. Had just enough shield to live there. But still a really nice kill in the 2v2. And now the Rift Tower are going to be channeled up as well. Kind oh, of no. unlucky that Karthus did not get that kill. Because now he doesn't even have an assist. Doesn't have a Dark Seal stack, let alone a Dark Harvest stack. And now he doesn't have that to help us side lane as well. So the global power that Team Liquid has kind of going to waste it still gets you the kill but you know not the herald push that you wanted not the gold on the Karthus. yeah not not extra right and which she certainly felt like you could have gotten in that play uh still nice for team liquid but we'll be looking for more with this herald that they've picked up also have to say that just watching giyu even in his last two games very active as a mid laner like He's roamed a lot in these first two games only, which is not something I necessarily earmarked him for watching his earlier games. So, again, very impressive to see EG come together as a team quite rapidly. And uh, Giyu certainly showing that, you know what, I can flex in lane, I can do the fancy plays, but also just has a lot of the fundamentals down. Like, I need to join my team when I have an advantage, right? He looks very clearly like he's trying to win. The moves that he's making are like, all right, I'm trying to put pressure. I'd certainly hope I'm so. trying to help. I, you'd hope so, but then there's some plays that I'm like, not not Giyu, but there's some times where you see some games like, and, and it's not that people aren't trying to win, it's that they're trying not to lose. And that's the big difference. Like, I see, yeah. Keeping the initiative. All right, Herald top lane. Brandini, 1v3, 1v4, I guess, with Shelly up there as well. TP, though, from AG. This is bold from Giyu. 1v3 attempt here, and that finally was a misstep on Giyu. After all the praise we piled on, the Caster Curse is real. Jenkins are going to TP in. You see we get to join in as well. There's the bowling ball. Knocks up two, but Matt out there to safety as he burns the heal on the TK. So five top for TL and only one kill, but Giyu just threw, one, threw his life away there. Got to remember. Oh, that's nice. Oh, Brandini, flash beast. What a play. Gets the trade back. Nice. Gets a nice stack there for him. That's a good snowball there for the Cho. I mean, this is a very strong pick when it comes to denying the tools your opponent can work with. A good silence against something like a Karthus in a team fight can just completely win you a 5v5. But that fight in the top lane was just a little funny watching the Irelia die right away. It's the difference between Trinity Force Irelia and Blade of the Rune King. Maybe Trinity could have survived a little bit longer, but with blade you don't have any hp you're just pure dps and if you get locked down you're probably going down with it yeah Ricara gonna take the first tower so brandini's heroics in the top lane with the flash feast not enough to keep the tower from falling down but eg happy to trade here for their second drake will be back uh, moving towards that soul point and it will be infernal rift this go around crumbs always a fun one to see Ooh, and that's one that would probably be more fun to see on the hands of Team Liquid, having a Karthus ultimate and then the Varus poke. It's always just more exciting to see these high damage spells dish out their deeps, but EG's Dragon Control has been the story of Game 1 and Game 2. They haven't really lost one. It was only the Elder that got stolen and then the Baron. Yep, haven't lost a Drake, just a Dragon. <laughs> Uh, as Yasui could be in trouble 1v2, but again, Orn just so tanky. Does have the Bramble Vest already, plus the Bomi Cinder, so I don't think he's too worried about even a stray arrow streaming in from Deathly here. Uh, Giyu continuing to stay active though, but TL starting to maneuver their pieces more towards the central sections of the map. We do have that long lane for Brandini to play in, so could be a bit tricky if he gets run down by a GP, or if the jungler comes to visit as well. And TP back in for Deathly, I believe. He's, he's going to join in here and just scoop up the farm in mid. Keep him in mid lane and then keep Aurelia in the side lanes on a 1v1. It's where she wants to be. She can be against the Gangplank as well, but they're happy with the Cho taking that matchup. He's built enough armor right now and has enough HP that the Gangplank harass is no longer a threat to his life. Yeah, we'll see if Giyu can uh, get some traction though in the side lane. And are those sneaking up here? Righteous Glory popped. Jenkins going to get chased down. Another great pillar there for Ana, but GP with the flash is going to get silenced. Knock up there as well. Now the orange is out. There's the flash we expected. And that is going to be Jenkins getting away. I'm surprised that Ana did not want to chase that further. They had sight on the mid lane that the roam was happening. And Gangplank was at half HP, but hey, they can always return to that one if their pillar accuracy is going to be that good. 
Well, we do have a pause, so we'll take a moment here as we get things sorted out and get back into the game as soon as we can. A uh, much more measured early game, though, I will say. It was kind of like... There was like a, a twinge of pain in my heart when I saw Schoenfire, like, die again. And I, again, not, not, not necessarily his fault that that happened, but I think it was still an overreach with Yasui going down to the mid lane and just a misread of the situation. Thankfully, since that point, uh, TLA have actually done a pretty good job of keeping the game at a fairly even pace. And I think we will get a very different early game here, Crumbs. Not the full 5,000 gold lead that we saw from EG, uh, you know, at 20 minutes like last game. I agree. I think the only similar thing from this early game has been the Dragons for Evil Geniuses. They have the Infernal as a potential, but they don't have the power in their lanes that they had before that just allows them to waltz right on through and get the objective that they want. They don't have the instant engage from the Callista Taric that they had before up against a very squishy Talia. This is a beefy frontline in the Cho'Gath and you've got the Irelia that's just will assassinate anybody on your lineup. So EG has to approach this very differently and it's what Team Liquid wanted to see from them. They banned three out of the five champions from game one. Let's see how prepared EG is with their picks here. I think the other thing about uh, the way the draft worked out with TL pivoting so heavily just to take out picks that they lost against is that like letting on through is something a lot of teams do not let it happen. And I think maybe EG with a game to give in some senses after winning the first one are thinking they can test the waters because... At some point, you might have to consider giving up Orn. You might as well take the risk earlier if you have to take it. But uh, as far as instant engage goes, like TL are in a much more solid place as far as, you know, letting things happen and letting things happen quickly, right? That was the thing that we didn't see out of them last game was that with just the Nautilus, it wasn't easy for them to start a fight with no map control. Even if you're in kind of a corner, Yasui can get it done very quickly with the Orn Horn. So I do like that element as well. And I, I'm curious to see how EG prepare against the Orn, especially because they also gave the Braum away and don't have the ability to, you know, cut off the engage with something like a Bromi. If you add up all the ultimates from the Team Liquid lineup, you've got yourself a very nasty engage. Gangplank ultimate on top of Orn, then you've got Karthus, maybe even the Varus ultimate spreading, and then Braum to defend. Like It is a really good 5v5, while EG is going way more in the split pushing, and they're going to have to use that Tom Kench and Ash to hopefully appear in the lane where Irelia is and get kills that way because the 5v5 is gonna be rough all right we'll certainly see how it resolves in just a few moments as we resolve this pause we'll be headed for a quick commercial break so you catch us back here after about three minutes Welcome back to game two of Evil Genius Academy versus Team Liquid Academy, where our crew is working to get the game back going. Uh, with any luck, things will be resolved in short order, but for now, Crumbs and I will continue to entertain you as we are paused about 15 minutes through this first game, which is significantly less one-sided in this early game. Yeah, and we're glad for that because yesterday's match was not one-sided at all it, or sorry it was very one-sided it was 3-0 from tsm so the fact that these two teams are a little bit closer now is a pretty good sign because it was actually the highest mismatch when they came to seeding third versus sixth and sometimes in fact most seasons that means a ton i felt like this season is the one time where placing in playoffs just doesn't mean that much both or all teams were so close when it came to making into the playoffs at the very end that a slight variance in reading the patch or just coming into the day better or being more prepared to play online can make a difference to turn whatever seating disadvantage you had yeah, it does feel like the one consistent thing for both Academy and LCS this split is that everything seems up for grabs unless you play against Cloud9. Because both Cloud9 <laughs> Academy and Cloud9 LCS look terrifying to play against right now. But of course, we'll see them in the next round of playoffs. The apple does not fall far from the tree. And it's true. Most of the teams, the way they approach the LCS is the way they approach the Academy roster. So a lot of the times, the things and teams that struggle in one league might actually have those same issues translated across their other squads yeah, it's funny too because i keep getting told that like it's difficult to practice with them because they have different practice schedules like they often practice in different places you know especially given the current circumstances and yet i still see lcs teams and academy teams looking very similarly both strategically and in like uh their success rate like it's not always one-to-one -one. like uh team liquid academy for example made playoffs lcs tl did not but 
it is funny to me how consistently the organizations show strength and even style across the different leagues. But again, I keep getting told that the amount of interaction they can have is limited because, again, they're on different schedules. So The players funny, I think. have limited interaction, but then the staff is involved in all those things and the overarching view of how the teams have to play is still controlled by the same entity. So I think that that really top-down approach to esports is what trickles down into the games despite the players not having that much interaction. It's like being raised by the same family, but then your younger oh. and older brother are, spar are far away. Like, okay, sure, you're, you're not really in contact, but because you came from the same environment, your approach is similar. Uh, still one big esports family. Well, uh, on, is on this game, uh, EG is still looking decent. I, where we left off, I feel like, was uh, that top lane teleport from Gi, which did look very silly, which was even funnier after all the praise we had just piled on him. Uh, does feel like there was probably a call made there that, like, hey, we can ulti up with Tom Kench. Uh, we'll be there. And it was just mistimed or miscommunicated. Uh with that idea in mind, I would like to see Deathly and Matt be a bit more proactive, I think, when we get back into this game. I feel like I haven't seen Deathly throw a single arrow, actually. Maybe he's thrown one that I've noticed, but uh, there are some time get ultimates happening, but I feel like Deathly needs to be pulling the trigger pretty often, because that's, you know, that's the reason you pick Ash. He threw one at the TP that Giyu did, and then Giyu died at the same time the arrow landed. Oh, so nice. There's like one flashy explosion, but... Yeah, I, I want to see Ash be more effective because the thing that I, I think this team can do is you use Hawkshot to find out Karthus's location in the jungle and then Tom Kench teleports you there and then you just kill him. So I would have liked to see more punishment to the Karthus when the game was more about laning. I think you can still do it. It revolves around having your scrying trinket, your Hawkshot, and then Tom Kench being level 11 for those longer range ultimates. And then you can start getting those kills that really matter when it comes to objectives. Well, I guess the other matchup we were looking at as well, as we do still have some time before the pause is resolved, is talking about top lane. You know, I feel like, uh, again, with the mishap in top lane <laughs> from Brandini earlier, uh, I was very f friend from Brandini earlier, I don't feel like we've really explored uh, the Gangplank Shogeth matchup fully. I did like the attempt of Ander in the top lane that we saw where he wanted to come top and try and at least get some pressure because you just can't let the Gangplank get away with farming the lane on his own forever. But I assume that Gangplank will take over that lane in due time if, if he hasn't if he isn't at that point already. Yeah, Gangplank really strong early against the Cho. So Cho is just hoping to have armor and HP. And then once he has enough, Gangplank can no longer worry about just harassing him down. He's just going to think about getting those parlay stacks on the minions. So that's what happened with the Cho. He just rushed enough armor and Gangplank said, oh, I got my kill early. I'm just going to farm. So now that we have a Gangplank that has farm and a Cho that has farm, Cho will really be focused on hitting crucial silences on targets or engaging with knockups. So the silence is, I think, the more important tool from him. Obviously, one-shotting somebody goes a long ways. But if you can CC somebody for three seconds from casting a spell, just think about the damage that can do to somebody like an Orn or a Karthus that has three seconds to just cast everything. I think certainly there is a very different burden of execution in this comp for EG. Uh, like we've seen Ander throw out uh, very precise pillars in a lot of his ganks. So I'm curious to see if he can keep that up in team fights. And I think with, you know, someone like Cho, which is very skill shot reliant from the rupture and even the scream, like you need to be in the right position and at using it on at the right times or on the right targets. Uh, I'm curious to see if EG can show a similar amount of team fight prowess because the fights they did win they took almost all of them very decisively but they had a much simpler time actually starting the engage so again i think if giyu is being backed up by his team properly if they're finding the right angles if the pillars are happening uh we can see a similar look for eg and maybe another a snowball -y kind of game from them but i mean on the other side for team liquid they have really simplified their game plan i mean if you're if the enemy team is going to give you on and you're going to play you're willing to play a champion like karthus your life is made significantly easier just from the existence of those two champions alone. It is. You don't even have to think about the upgrade. And uh, I, I'm glad that you got us thinking about how EG is going to be doing these team fights because now that we're starting to think you have your carries are Irelia and Ash, so there's no AOE damage here. All single target, 
not the greatest wave clear. And then you've got Cho and a Trundle for support. So they're really low on the damage department here. They need to look for these picks on the side lane and avoid team fighting probably as much as possible. There's going to be a point where they were just not going to be able to keep up despite the Orn being very squishy and the Trundle being a front line. So EG is picking something very different here that will have to have a lot of practice behind it because this is one of the toughest positions to be in. One where you can't take a 5v5 and you only have to look for numbers advantages. So it revolves on staying focused for looking for the play. So being with being, sorry, holding the initiative and pulling out the second you get that pick and, and backing out. So the restraint is the second component. Yeah, I think uh, again, to circle back a big amount of focus on Deathly and Matt using their globals correctly because you didn't draft Ash Tom Kench to not make plays with them. So we'll see how that shakes out. I guess the other component that I didn't really think about is Cho'Gath is pretty good against Orn as far as trying to cancel his ultimate goes. It's not as free as like Singed who makes, or like Cassio who makes uh, Orn's life miserable when he's trying to ult in the middle of a team fight. But uh, you definitely, we could see Brandini also line up some pretty key stuns and uh, silences to prevent the Orn from uh, kicking the ram back towards the enemy team. Obviously, he has to be close enough to do it. Like, Feral Scream's range is actually pretty short. Ruptures is a bit bigger, but Orn tends to initiate, like, a screen away from you in a lot of cases. So it's not perfect, but I think there are some tools there for uh, Evil Geniuses to maybe get it done. Also, Trundle, I think, can do it as well. Yeah. But you have to have an extremely well-timed knock-up with the pillar. So I'm not counting on Ander to do that consistently. That's what I was thinking. I was like, well, if Cho can't do it, let's see if Ander has the reflexes to, to get the pillar in the way of Orn. It can work. I mean, worst case scenario, you just slow him down enough that he can't even follow up on the knockup. Maybe he hits it, but then <laughs> like you're like, that. all right, I, I, can't, I can't even slam, right? You can interrupt his own charge with your pillar. Mm -hmm. That's true. This uh, It's fun. I feel like Trundle Pillar is uh, kind of underappreciated for how powerful it is. Like, it's, it's like a little mini knockup, so it can interrupt channels and stuff. Uh, the slow is immense, and the zone persists the entire time you're on it. Um, I th and the range is like ridiculously long. So I think a lot of it is just you don't think about it as being like it's just a slow, right? When you read the tooltip, it doesn't seem that powerful. But as you learn how to position it correctly around terrain and like the different interactions it has, there is definitely a huge discrepancy between like someone's first few Trundle games that's just learning a champion and someone that has played, you know, countless games of Trundle and has mastered how to use that utility. Oh, it's huge. One has become a master troll. So a master <laughs> troll is something to really that's fear because then you just don't know what you're up against. It can always be surprised. Uh, Trundle got buffed, right? The pillar got, I think, a few more ticks on the slow, and then his frozen domain got really buffed up. And I was actually just thinking, why don't we just have a fire Trundle skin? He's a ice guy, pillar of fire. You you avoid it anyways. It doesn't have to be physical terrain. That's true. I know that uh, Chat has been on the Trundle is good train for uh, a while now, so he really likes that champion. Uh, so he was happy to see that back in competitive. And uh, it has been successful. I think it is also better than just like a tank counter pick, right? Like we see it all the time in Tessejuani. That's the most common use case for Trundle Jungle. But uh, I think Ander is showing that like you can play this champion as kind of a regular jungler and have it be effective. So uh, even though it doesn't specifically answer Karthus in any way, there's obvious ways that I think Trundle can just be effective. So certainly looking forward to how the rest of this game plays out. Not too sure what we're up to as far as getting ourselves back into the game, but we'll be with you until that happens. I imagine players and everyone else are working to get things sorted out. This is unfortunately just one of the uh, one of the challenges with working with a remote broadcast. It's much easier to fix someone's computer when you can physically walk over to it on a stage and work on it. Uh, trying to troubleshoot remotely, obviously very different. Of course. Every, and uh, it might not be obvious to people, but everyone wants to everyone wants to get the game going. Everyone wants to watch oh, it. Yeah. Everyone's working to get it back on track. So it, everyone knows what needs to be done. We just sit here and talk. We have the easiest Exactly. We're actually the only people not doing anything. <laughs> yeah. We're not working on it at all. We're just, we're just filling the space <laughs> until the game comes back around and we can do the other part of our job again. Uh, also, again, like servers are different, tournaments online, connections can be very fickle. 
Uh, all things considered, I've actually been very impressed with the quality of the remote broadcast. And also, like, we didn't have, uh, you know, our faces in Champ Select, you know, the last time we did this crumbs. Yeah, we're here now this time. So yeah. not only is the broadcast staying at the, the level it's been brought to, but it's kind of cool to see it actually get upgraded as well. We've got B-roll, yeah. right? The start of the show. Oh, that's true. We have replays. Didn't have yeah. that. That was cool. I mean, you can see some other broadcasts try to make the remote show go and it is not easy to pull off something with this many people and these many computers like if you think about just how many people are involved just to run the turn the game itself you got like at least 12 people right inside expect spectating as well yeah i mean we've had like you know we run uh major events you know somewhat remotely uh, we ran worlds remotely last year and that was again also a surprisingly smooth experience but that's also with an entire team on the ground every player playing at the server that's there and then an entire professional production studio <laughs> working to get the relayed back so that we can commentate the games from a different country like uh my home computer is not nearly as well equipped let's say unfortunately though we do need to take another commercial break but we'll update you with the status of the game as soon as we can after this And we are back to the second game where the team was able to successfully chrono break an oh. online game. Unfortunately, due to the delay necessary for remote play, we have now missed a couple minutes of gameplay. But we'll be able to show you the rest of the action. So, Crumbs, we are now going to test your memory. Because it's been a while since <laughs> we saw the game. We'll see exactly how much you remember from the last time we left off. Well, not just testing the memory, but we're going to test our investigation skills. We'll see if we can see the scoreboard, look at the map and deduce what just happened. Yeah, but uh, thankfully, at least the point where we did last leave you, uh, the game had actually been at a pretty uh, even point. You know, there'd been some back and forth, but for the most part, the game had remained in a pretty calm state. We'll see if it's uh, been thrown into chaos once again when we do move back to the game, which will be in just a minute or so. But it's funny that we were talking about the wonders of remote technology and then we're told that we needed to go to a break and had Chrono broken the game. So very impressive that the game will go on, on and play on uh, in just a few moments. We don't even get to Chrono Broke in person a lot of the time. The fact that it happens online is... Yeah. Um, should we be doing more online tournaments? <laughs> <laughs> this is the answer, clearly. Just put it all yeah. online, Crumbs. Crum you never have to leave your house again. If I had Chrono Break, I don't think I would... Like, personally on my computer, almost like a practice tool, I don't even think I'd play new games of League. I would just replay <laughs> all the scenarios that I want to improve on and just go over it again and again and again. Like a late game, everybody has a full build. Just go for Baron fights and see what happens. Well, as an update, TL have paused again, but we will be starting again soon, uh, as far as I know. So again, we should have the game back up and running to where we left off just a few minutes into the future, and we'll deduce exactly how things have broken down from there. Uh, look into the... To the Remember future. that we are in the past, Crumbs. Yeah. <laughs> we are technically in the past. So... We are... Yeah. Oh, I don't want to... I don't want to get into metaphysical topics let's talk about league of legends <laughs> let's talk about league of legends i'm excited to talk about league especially once the game is back up and running but again we'll bring it to you as soon as we have the gameplay as a reminder we do have to build up delay for the sake of competitive integrity which is why we're in the past so we do know some of the things that are happening but don't always know how long the issues will last but regardless even if the game is back up and running we do have to make sure we build up the necessary amount of delay in order to maintain the integrity of the game let's see if i can remember the team comps off the top of my head crumbs on the tl side gang playing caught this on varus and brom yes is the tla side Perfect. and eg choga oh we'll get there What's Ender playing? Trundle. Choga, Trundle, Aurelia, Ash, Tom, Kench. Nice. There you go. Now I saw them in the break screen. And I couldn't remember them. Up let's get. Game. Let's go even. But that's that's. Those are the comps. What about the draft order? Oh goodness. Um, I can't remember the bands that much. Like like the order certainly. But uh, I mean, I can remember some of the bands, but not all of them. That's especially not in order. That's too hard. Yeah. But the pick order was yeah. first pick on pick Tom Kench. Trundle? Irelia. Oh, it was Irelia, you're right. Irelia, then they picked... They didn't pick Karthus, they picked... Bottom lane? I think they picked... Yeah, they picked Varus Brom. Yeah. Then... What did they take after that? 
They might have taken... No, they didn't take Trundle. They picked Trundle fourth, which means they had to take either... Oh, they took Ash to join the Tom Kench. Yeah. Then some more bands happened that, again, I can't remember exactly what they were. Then they took Trundle out of that phase, and then uh, I guess technically, if I'm trying to be most accurate, I think they took GP... Then Karthus. I think it was Karthus yeah. last. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. I mean, obviously they picked together, but yeah, I think okay. technically that was the order, and then last picture, obviously. I think I remember some of the bands. Blue Side Band, Olaf, Sejuani, and... Oh, okay, I don't remember the last one just yet. And then Red Side had band Aphelios, Set, Set and, and Senna. Senna. Yeah. And then the what next two were awesome. Gragas, and maybe it was even the Cassiopeia. Oh, what? Teal Band Rumble. Oh, that was in phase two. I like how we could look this up, but it's way more fun to try. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just exciting to be like, oh, yeah, I still remember this. So long ago. I mean, we are going to have our memories tested, Crumbs. Don't forget. Uh, once, once we do jump back into the game, which should be in about a minute or so, uh, we will have to see how well our memories can be used to remember the game state. As a reminder, the game was had to be chrono broken. We are continuing to build up delay. Whoa. So this stuff had not <laughs> happened uh, beforehand. This is a great time to hop back into the game. Yeah. Stuff has definitely happened, though. I can tell you that much. The numbers have shifted. The third dragon is still on the table, and that may very well be what the teams are fighting for. Giyu diving in onto Schoenfei, gonna take him down. And uh, we're back with a with a bang. Eight to six now, the kill score. Team Liquid up uh, 700 gold or so, but the third drake, probably the big prize here is Evil Genius says, get the pick onto the jungler and look to take their third drake and their first infernal. Yeah, setting themselves up for that infernal soul don't fear not it says that they have left the game they are still here in the game that's why we're still playing you can even see him he's moving around so yep, ignore they already the left the game it is just an artifact of the past do not worry so all right so that's the drake over feast there for brantini not even needed actually because he doesn't even have it and an easy take of the objective so eg once again up to a pretty early track for this dragon soul here yeah that's been their win condition focusing on those objectives they are behind in gold and i still stand by that their team fight is weaker than team liquid so i i don't know how that last one started but 5v5ing into the mid lane with the bot lane dead right away is quite the mystery to to deduce to be honest uh Gyu's ulti had something to do with it by the looks of the freeze frame i saw before we came into the game but uh, we'll see how the future team fights play out here and if EG can indeed snowball to Seoul and have the game go from there. Once again, this was kind of how the early game went. It was worse for Team Liquid, certainly as far as the gold went. Although, once again, EG have claimed all these drakes. But uh, if EG can get this Seoul uncontested, or at least unscathed, how do they look closing out the game, I think is the question we'll continue to ask. Because this is one of the hottest looking teams Certainly deserving of the seed they picked up in third. Potentially could have even been second, given Dignitas's little slump towards the end of the season. Mm, but once they pick it up, I think it's still going to have to be split pushing or try to get a fight before Team Liquid can realize the fight is happening. Because they can burst somebody really quickly. I assume that's what happened in that last one. You're saying that the Aurelia ultimate has something to do with it. And if Aurelia catches into the back line, she can definitely delete a Varus before he can count to five. Yeah, Karthus with no Zonius as well is like very squishy. And there's an arrow out onto Cal. He's pretty tanky. Trying to corrupt him, gonna try and disengage, but Anna popped the stone plate. He's running into the front line here at Brangini. Already took down Rikara. Great devour there from Matt as. They were trying to get that next kill, but Brandini a little too low, gonna keep dodging out the Carthus Qs, but the slow there from Cal is probably gonna seal Brandini's fate. No, he dances back away because Yasui's in too much trouble. Giyu dancing back on, gets the jump onto Jenkins, is gonna make it too, and there's the Requiem is not enough to get a kill for that Carthus, so EG once again winning the team fight. What a painful ultimate from Schoenfire. He can't get Carthus. They bought too much time. He was able to regen back up, and now EG is going to get an easy Baron here. They started the fight off with the arrow, and they had Cho flanking from the side. Trundle with the stone play was good enough to stay tanky. They are so fast and engaging that Team Liquid just does not know how to respond. Yeah, Giyu playing wonderfully in these team fights, but all of EG on the same page when they're looking for these engages, and that will indeed be Baron over to Evil Geniuses. Brandini was not there and didn't even have Feast, even if he was. 
So watch this team fight again. How did this go down? There's the arrow. It's the Cho. They had no vision of him coming in from the bottom lane. So while they knew that the Trundle wasn't close, Cho was right there next to them with the CC. And the dive for Yasui onto Deathly, countered by the Devour, and then Giyu better late than never, as what a stun from Matt! Stop Yasui from resetting that ultimate and then sealed the deal on the back end of this fight. Giyu popped off. I was looking at Karthus to see if he was going to hit the Q on the Cho'Gath, but the fact that he missed it was actually what kept him alive. That would have been a 400 gold bounty. Enough to yep. finish the Morellos for Shern, and that Morellos would have made a big difference here, because this is a 1 and 5 Karthus. Not exactly the threat from the sky that you wanted to have on your team when you drafted him. Nope, and now it's uh, EG on the Red Bull Baron power play for two more minutes. I'll have the Drake also up in 1 minute 20 to try and clean the Infernal Soul. And Giyu is just busy taking the easy towers in the side lane up in top right now. Going to take down that outer tower and continue to extend the gold lead that EG now find themselves with. Up about 3,000 gold after that top outer tower falls. So... A lot of work for Team Liquid to do in not a lot of time here, Crumbs. No, not a lot of time for sure, because now there's one minute before the Infernal Soul is on the map for EG. It really has teleport, or will have it for this fight, so she can choose to either split push or join. I think EG will want to take the fight. They feel really confident with how these arrows have been going. They know that Karthus is weak right now, and that the upgrade items have not come through. Oh, well, big pick on Andrew. If they can get it, he does have his stone play, but the Valor is trying to get there. Can't find it. The ulti misses from Varus, but the Orn Horn will not miss onto Matt, who's trying to kite away. And already dead, though, means the chance that the soul are diminishing. As Team Liquid, they're going to pick number two. They will find it. Rakara able to seal the deal on that one. That five-man commitment is still being answered, though. Giyu can trade an inhibitor for this, and no one is basing. So that's what EG is going to get out of this one. Inhibitor for a... First dragon of the Denial of the Soul. Yeah, we'll see if you can finish off the inhibitor. Looks like you will be able to because Team Liquid do not feel confident backing one or two members off to try and stop the Aurelia. So with Baron still up for 35 seconds, Giyu doing a lot of damage here as he does finish off that inhibitor, but will back away after the Drake does go over to Team Liquid. So, uh, and a dying there, certainly unfortunate for evil geniuses, but, uh, not the best of trades still for Team Liquid, despite all the success in that fight. The fact that the Giyu was in a position to trade is a really strong testament to EG being in the right position, because normally Anda, if he were to be picked off there, it's a disaster. He dies, the bottom lane can't do anything, Tom Kench is not no longer thinking about engaging, and they give up the dragon. But because Irelia is just already at the turret, it means that every second that TL spends on the Trundle is seconds that she's hammering away at turret. So, Anda should be thanking Giyu there for his presence in top for salvaging his mistake. Yep. I mean, only one Drake for TL certainly worthwhile overall for EG as Giyu continues his pressure in the other side lane now as he will look to attack the bottom lane. The other cool thing I like about EG's uh, comps that they've actually drafted this series is that they got a little bit of extra objective control, right? They had the Callista in the first game that has the rend, and one of the things that we always talked about with Cho, but actually I've forgotten until this point, is that Feast is excellent at securing objectives as well. It's one of the few skills that exists alongside Callista and Nunu that can actually help you take down big monsters. So it does seem like EG's Dragon Control has certainly been a priority for them this series, but they're also drafting help to make sure they can get those objectives more often than not. And it's a really positive change for Cho that he gets to add those Dragon and Baron stacks to his stack pool because it encourages him to want to be there in the fight, to secure the objective, not just to split push and, and not be there with the team. So I like that the Cho change is about him being a team player, and that's what he's going to be now, grouping up with the team despite he having the teleport. It's a 4v4 in mid here, but Bakara busy in the top lane does mean that Giyu has potentially some free time on this tier 2 turret in bottom lane. There's no Baron uh, anymore for EG. It will be back up in a minute 20. We'll see how much damage Giyu can actually do here right now. Jenkins going to keep the waves back with the barrels and the rest of TL rotating in just to keep the Aurelia honest. So certainly executing on the split push strategy right now are evil geniuses. 
So it looks like we'll have to take a reset and gear up for the next objective because that next Baron does feel pretty important for both teams here. And we already know that EG can take it quite quickly. And Giyu is strong enough that if there is no help for his counterpart, he will dive them 100 to 0 again. <laughs> here he goes, trying to take down Jack. Hey, look! Arrow also all oh, almost predicted perfectly, but still a kill there for Giyu, regardless. Dodges around the Orn ultimate as well. And here comes Tom Kench to save him. Ulti is good, but the Devour from Matt is perfectly timed after the Abyssal Voyage. And Matt will throw his life away if he has to, but still getting strong. Here's the Rupture, finds it onto the front side. Definitely low, but he takes down the tower. And now EG gonna launch into the team fight. It's just so tough for TL to get through the front line as they finally bear through and kill Deathly. But a stun lands, the rupture is going to force Shun Fire to flash. EG will take that trade. They've got minions in the top. Nexus turret, they're going to get a turret. Oh, no, no. It's only the bot lane and mid tier two. So not going to destroy the Nexus, but taking that tier two down sets them up for the Infernal Soul. A minute 30 from that objective now. And Matt came into that as a hero. Ulting in just to devour Gi, you knowing mm -hmm. that he was going to be in trouble is such a great Tom Canton supporting move. Now, unfortunately for Deathly, was uh, not available to be saved, so it did go down for the trade, but great call on the dive there, Crumbs. Happened about as you said it, as Giyu just leaps into action and takes out Jenkins with help from his team. That's certainly more of the combination we expected here. And again, I like that Matt is drafting champions that not only can help Deathly, but can help Giyu if he wants to be aggressive and diving on more of these Assassin-style champions. So again, the EG synergy across the board Seems, uh, seems like a team that has been practicing very hard and building up a lot of strength as a full five-man unit. However, enough talk for now on that front. It is time to set up for our next objectives, e.g. around the Baron. At least going to threaten that for about 30 more seconds until they need to move over to the other side and make sure they have dominion over the Dragon. As TP in from mid lane, going to find the Rupture onto Shurn. Cow on the front side is going to get ulted up by the Ash, so that's going to be a kill onto the Braum. No, not yet! Vanguard's Edge is good from Giyu, finds the knockoff, but the Cho already dead as Giyu dove way too deep there and will be picked off. What a bad time to go for an engage there from EG. They didn't have full vision. There wasn't a Hawk shot that was used before to figure out what happened. They only saw that Shurnfire was there and they engaged onto the Vrom. That's going to give them an Infernal and maybe even set up EG for a... Sorry, Team Liquid for a Baron? Wow, being so close to a game-winning objective is usually not the time to take fights without the proper information. Yeah, I mean, the impetus is like, okay, if we get this pick, we are guaranteed to get the objective, right? And they think if they get the soul that the game is all but won. But I think they can also afford to be a bit more patient given the position they're in, and they're not exercising that particular pillar of strategy just yet as TL are going to get onto this Baron here. Ander is in the area, but this is going to be a tough steal. Over he goes, looks for it, does not get it, and Matt can't devour him out either, so that's just a free kill as well. Wow, that is really good for Team Liquid. Now they have the gold lead. This is eerily familiar to that last game. They're starting to now hit their stride. The items of upgrades are coming through now from Yasui Trinity Force, already upgraded on Jenkins. We might have ourselves a very competitive series here. Certainly looking good so far as we watch this one again. I mean, Andrew and Matt, they knew what they wanted to do here. TL did not take down this boss code, so there was maybe an opportunity, but... Just a really clean smite there for Shurnfire. 791, then, yeah. That was the time that the, the smite came through there from Karthus. I think in that moment, and I know this is really odd, but... It comes from experience. If you're trying to steal in the face of an enemy, so if they see you and the angle that you're taking to get a steal, usually flashing in is more effective than going for a blast gun or using a movement skill because it comes unpredictable. And that's what makes a Baron steal happen. The fact that it comes out of nowhere. Not that the enemy just sees it and, oh, I just got flat out 50-50. It's, oh crap, I didn't even know the jungler was in the smite right now. Yeah. Regardless, so it is TL that pick up the objective as a result, so now they're the ones pushing up into the mid lane, already taking out the tier 2 and trying to threaten for an inhibitor. Gi busy running damage control in the side lanes, but top inhib is reopened for the taking if EG want to go for it. It's just a long walk to get to that particular objective right now, so it does feel like EG are going to have to continue being patient and play for that Dragon Soul once again after the Baron wears off, and we'll see if they can finally 
figure things out around this objectives because it is funny to see the two games play out almost identically eg they find a good lead in the mid game and then when it comes to those key moments around ending the game or taking that you know the second to last step this feels like tiela coming online and able to punish very heavily and that varus is ready for some punishment he's an item up on death a whole infinity edge and 700 gold bounty so those frontliners are dying very quickly. You can't really go in to deal with how much damage Team Liquid is pumping out, even though they want to. Yeah, Righteous Glory, Brandini wants to try and find it. Giyu with the GA, he's also very strong. Like, I can see the EG are eager to pick a fight here, but gonna have to pick the right one. And again, it has been some recklessness that feels like you've caught EG off guard as Giyu's gonna go for the flank now. Ooh, here we go. He, they want to commit to this. Gonna have to pick off Rikara Vanguard's edge. Flashes in, that's a good one. Wow. That is gonna be the shutdown. EG, find the fight. Yasui though, maybe gonna turn it back around, gets a good knockout. The Requiem also gonna go down, but Giyu staying alive. Well, Resurrect now in the Guardian Angel. Maybe didn't have to use it, but I think thought Matt had Devour. Now it's Jenkins that's gonna get chased down, but three dead on the side of Team Liquid. Evil Genius is finally piecing it together at a critical moment. Jenkins gonna flash the rupture, but Ander still chasing. Yusui also mid lane, but I think EG are interested in maybe ending the game here. They get the slow. Jenkins doesn't really have anywhere to run, but it might take him a while to go down. Shogath probably strong enough to do it. Here's Ash to make sure that Jenkins dies a bit swifter as Brandini does finish him off with the feast. And Giyu answers the mid lane there as Yusui was trying to counter push. But still, Evil Genius, despite getting four kills, cannot extend that push. Pastry I got shivers from that flank from Giyu. That was such a good move. It was honestly one of the best I've seen. He might become the most exciting academy player for the season for me at this point because he has never stopped being assertive. In every play, this is an Aureli that's looking for an angle to engage and immediately deletes the Varus that was the most important target. I was highlighting how the Infinity Edge was just going to be a ton of DPS to deal with and, well, it doesn't really matter if he's dead. Yep, Rikara just taken completely out of the picture there as EG finally find a nice angle. It is... Very impressive how well Gyu has been playing, and it would, it'd be funny, it'd be almost like winning an Academy Award for being in a film for 20 minutes, right? Like, Gyu has played so little of this split, but it's been so impressive that he certainly does deserve the praise, but we're gonna have to circle back because the Dragon's Soul is back up for the taking, and TL are looking for this fight again here. It shouldn't be a fight, Brandini can just secure it with Beast. Here comes Yasui, knock up, not gonna happen there. They try to go for it, but here's the flank. Again, the pinch comes in for Brandini and Giyu. Rupture finds two, they're gonna eat Rikara. He goes down instantly as Rik Giyu, now gonna dive back around, gets the Vanguard dead down. He's still dancing around his teammates as Matt finds a devour and it takes down Shurnfire. And that's gonna be lights out for this objective. EG will circle back, they'll take it down, they'll grab the soul. And finally, towards the back end of the game, some hiccups here and there, but it's still Evil Genius Academy looking ahead. They are now picking on Rikara. They kill him so fast, he hasn't even had the time to use Flash in these last two fights. He's held it every time. The CC and speed at which he disappears is crazy. The Cho just Flash feasts him. That's half his HP. Infernal Solar Rally here behind Matt. Here's Ander as well. The TP also coming through EG, trying to make sure this ace happens. And there's another kill. Jenkins the next. Blast plant. No, it's actually a barrel, but as Jenkins gets a bit more extra speed, Rikara back up in one second. So Ace now off the table as EG continue to chase members of Team Liquid. Here's Ander and Brandini. Plenty of CC to go around. A wonderful pillar. A silence as well. On can't reenact the ultimate as Rup Rupture also finds the knock up. And Ander does get the kills. The feast was not quite enough as Evil Genius is continuing to find picks and now straight back to Baron. Great timing on that play. And it's a dragon fight that never really quite ended, turned into that chase around the red brush and EG just holds it together. It, are we gonna have the same kind of games this whole series where Maybe. they fall behind and then think, all right guys, come on, let, let's think about how we should win. And then after they thought about the execution, they pull it off, they know the right targets to go for and now they're looking like they're unstoppable despite giving up those two infernals to Team Liquid. Yeah, we'll see if EG can finish the game off cleanly from this point, right? Because they're still, they still haven't done it yet. We've got an Elder Dragon they could maybe take in four minutes if they need it. They've got Baron for two and a half minutes here. There's a top inhibitor open. Like, all signs point to this game. 
ending on EG's next move. It's just a matter of EG setting themselves up correctly to do so. And Team Liquid, if nothing else, Crumbs, have been extremely stubborn this game. They, this series, actually. <laughs> they have been stubborn, yet their draft continues to keep them into the game. They have a ton of items now, a lot of damage. They want to take these front-to-back fights again. They've lost both because they got flanked, whether it was Irelia flashing over the wall or Cho attacking from one side while the poke was coming in from another. Rikara needs to be peeled for, and this is when you had, you just think about, let's play man-to-man. -man. Somebody's got to cover Irelia, whether that's the Braum, whether that's the Orn, somebody's got to cover the Ash, and you just go through that series of checks and balances and once you're done, you have a good idea of how you should play around Varus. Well, looks like EG are going to get this top inhibitor unless TL want to make a really big, uh, a big deal of it. And looks like it's not really on the cards, so that inhibitor will go down. Now, what else happens with this Baron? Minute 25 in the Red Bull Baron power play for EG. Still looking to try and close out this game. Not split pushing here, and the wave clear is really troublesome from Team Liquid because it's not just the wall that you have to deal with or even the barrels, it's the Orn Q. He throws one of those and somebody steps up. That could be the start to the fight that Team Liquid wants. Gyu also threatening for a potential wraparound here in mid lane as Brandini considering peeling off the bottom as well. EG don't really have that much left with Baron. They've got about uh, two waves left to play with, so this first one's going to crash in. They are going to go for the dive. Show and fire the target. Going to get poked down to high heaven and able to finish that off as Brandini in the front side with a very nice Zonyas as Giyu continues to try and find the fight. Still a good four-man Vanguard's edge, but Giyu now no protection. Dodges out of that Winter's Bite, finds a two-man stun as EG leap in to try and finish off the tower, but they don't have enough resources. The minion wave is already gone. Giyu going to dive in, but that's a bridge too far. Going to get himself resurrected, though, under the tower, but Matt can't leap in to save him. Not going to burn the flash. Aurelia will throw her life away as TL still hold on. We're still going. We're still in here and they can't seem to break the base when Rikara is not threatened from multiple angles. EG is lost when it comes to these fights. They need to be more patient with the minion waves. They were slow on time. They had two Baron pushes like you were mentioning, Pastry, and now that's the end of it. No longer do they have that tool, so it might just go back to another fight around Dragon and Rikara still has flash so it's not like the flank is guaranteed they still have to outplay them and i think look you could argue that trading brandini for Shurnfire feels okay you know i think brandini actually could have even got out potentially uh but i think just taking the first pick is okay and then continue sieging and then retreat reset and go play for this dragon exactly but Giyu really wanted to make it work in that tower dive and despite creating a ton of space for his team there's no way for the rest of his team to really follow up on it. So we'll continue. Arrow going to hit. Oh my god, another deep TP here. Giyu again, dancing around. Back on the cow, he goes a three-man Vanguard Zed friend. Is he trying to get in there? Rikara, the one going to be threatened, but he can't be attacked just yet as Ender on a rampage takes down Cal, but Brandini is going to flash out a beautiful little play to just escape with his life. They really want to catch this Varus, but he's so far back and they played front to back on Team Liquid, so they were able to use the Braum shield to really keep him alive. Giyu did not have his flash to go for a really Hail Mary play like he did that previous siege onto the mid lane. And we're starting to feel like EG is feeling a little desperate in these fights because that wasn't a fight that was over any major objectives. It was just, we see it now, let's just take it, and if we can get it, we're going to win the game. If they won that, they would have gotten yep. it. But there was no indication that they would be been able to f hit Rikar with everything. It was only Giyu that had an angle on the Varus. All right, well, Dragon spawned. Looks like EG will be able to take this very quickly. So TL, Despite the back and forth, this reset means that EG are first back out on the map and with the Trogath Feast, they will easily secure this objective as definitely of all people is the one to finish off the objective. But now with Elder Dragon, now EG can play a little bit more slowly. So watch this one again. This looked, this looked like ridiculous from Giyu. Like I thought he was dead for sure. So Braum tanks it, this is really good. And Ricard just gets to walk back and now the chains are spreading here. It dodges out of the Cho, and it's just Averis continuing to dish out damage. Karthus doesn't care if he dies in that side, and 
if he dies, he just zones even more members. So, EG, I, I like the look, and it did get them that dragon. I feel like it's not enough, and I only say that because the last objectives that they keep getting don't translate to breaking the base. They all translate to these team fights that Team Liquid just barely holds on to. Yeah, Gee's got no teleport either, so if he wants to commit to this side lane, which right now he does, he is committed uh, if EG try and play for this Baron. So they're going to have to balance pretty carefully here. Of course, if everyone goes bottom lane to kill the Aurelia, and EG can take the Baron nice and quickly, so they are going to force the issue. We can see that TL are bottom lane, but EG are just trying to rush down this Baron, and it looks like they will get it without a contest. The super mini waves in top lane, a little too much pressure alongside the Aurelia for Team Liquid Academy to fight for these buffs. Honestly, both are good calls, because you're not going to fight EG at the dr at the Baron pit. They have Elder, and the Aurelia is going to threaten the split push, so the best thing you can do is try to catch Aurelia, and then Giyu recognizes it and backs off. So both teams trying to do what they can, and Team Liquid just knows that they need to hopefully stall off this Elder and get that same dive defense that they had on the first mid lane siege. All right, well, the top inhibitor's back. The Baron is taking down the second inhibitor tower. So now two inhibs are open. Giyu is working on the third. Surely, with 40 seconds left on Elder and this Baron for basically the full duration, EG can finish off the game from this point. GP ult down. Here's Yasui. Lining it up. Finds one. It's only Anda. And he takes a lot of damage, but he does not die. Tondal is able to heal that back up. Gee was broken open the bottom half of the map as well. The Baron up cannons will be able to finish this off. So, gonna make it three inhibs and Baron for two minutes for EG. They can just walk the supers into the Nexus at this point. They just need to be patient, Crumbs. No one needs to die here. You've got Pillar and Cho to zone off. You've got Tompkins to devour. The minions will do all the work here, but TL wants to fight, opening up with a part of this ult. Yep, they have to try something, but that poke just doesn't really mean much at this point in the game. Again, EG for once will exercise patience as they look to end this game. Look at that cannon doing its little work against the top lane Nexus turret. More supers are coming in. They still have a long ways on this Baron and no Karthus ultimate now. Gangplank and Orn are back up with their ults. Knockups happening. Redemption now from Yasui to try and reset the fight. But again, the Nexus turrets are the prize as there's one. Great ult again. Four man Vanguard dead from Giyu as he dives back into the team fight. GA once again will be proccing, but Iti just trying to end the game here in front of the Nexus. It is open. They're going to shoot it down. And it's going for it alongside Deathly, and they'll take it down. EG, it's a little bit messy, but it gets the job done. That was so close. Team Liquid actually was very close to defending that one. Holy smokes, they, the, EG went on the left-hand side and it was because Rikara was trying to keep himself alive more than defending the Nexus that Team Liquid ends up losing that one. We, we are 2-0 in favor of EG, but these have yeah. not been... 2-0 games. This has been very close series. Y yeah, so yesterday, TSM Academy 3-0'd, and that, that went about as you'd expect against 100 Thieves, right? You don't even have to watch the games. You just have to look at the scoreline and have me tell you that, hey, imagine a 3-0, that's what it was. If this is also a 3-0, not going to be the same story. We're 2-0 or up, but still very close between the two t sides. But Crumbs, I think we need to take a break. Evil Genie says they are up 2-0 in their first quarterfinal match. We'll see if Team Liquid Academy can stave off the sweep when we return.